Today, we're using radish honey to make two awesome mead recipes. So let's get started. Now, some of you are, might have already said or started to Google, what is radish honey or what does it taste like? Radish honey is the pollination process slash really what the bees do on radish plants, basically gone back to their colony and then form, <laughs> formed honey. I'm not gonna go deeper than that, but um, what does radish honey taste like? Specifically from the company that sold this to me, they say that radish honey has the flavor of rose petals, butterscotch, and a hint of vanilla. Now, I got this from Flying Bee Ranch, which is a company I've used a lot for honey. I love them because they're awesome, great people, and they also have a lot of fun honeys. I'll put links down below for them. But that's what they say about this honey. I picked some up from them, about a, a what was it, a half gallon, so six pounds. And I decided, what do I want to do with this? I tasted it, and I thought, what would be a fun combination? Of course, a traditional is kind of like a requirement for me because I wanna know just base value, base value what the honey does for a mead. Then I was also wanting to pair it with a fruit or some other flavor. So I, I had some maraschino cherries lying around and I was like, what about this? I wonder what a maraschino cherry mead would taste like. So after looking at my maraschino cherries, which I had bought in bulk in basically the juice, and it was like the kind of stuff you get for like an ice cream party that you're gonna take and just dip a bunch of those cherries on top of stuff. They're not necessarily high quality, I'll say that, but they were cherries nonetheless, they looked fun. Um, I looked at that, thought the honey would be interesting with this profile, and we went ahead and started to create the recipes you see on screen. The traditional is basic, honey, water, and yeast, specifically the Lauvin 71B1122 because it's a pretty clean fermenter and it honestly does well with mead in my experience. Um, the traditional started with that recipe you see on screen and I ended up oaking it and I'll talk about the process here in a second, but I wanted to get that base value of the honey and I think I did, I think I accomplished it as you can see over here. Next up, we have the maraschino cherry, or just the cherry version. Had some extra additions you'll see on that recipe card. Um, we also used Lavin 71B because I thought it was going to be interesting to use specifically for this brew, and so that's what we did. You'll notice on that recipe card there was some cherry juice involved, and that's because I wanted to continue to highlight slash add some complexity of uh, cherries in this mix, so that's why that's there. So we formulated these recipes, and they're kind of adapted as we went along. I wanna make sure and, note and let you know that these recipes weren't, like what you see on the screen was not what I totally intended to do at the beginning especially with the cherry one. It was an adaptation over time, but I think it turned out really good. The traditional was pretty standard. Beep, 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 beep. Breaking news, we bring you today's sponsor, Z Biotics. Z Biotics is the world's first pre-alcohol probiotic that is intended to help you after that rough night of drinking. We've all been there, you've had a little too much fun, you stayed hydrated, but you still just don't feel great in the morning. Z-Biotics is a new way to combat that and to feel better. PhD scientists invented this product to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that makes you feel miserable the next day. Just remember to drink Z-Biotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. These come in a six pack. Generally, you can buy as many as you want. You have a little, um, I wanna call this instruction slash explanation of what's happening here for the um, product itself. These come in a half ounce fluid, I mean a shot, you can think of it like that. Now they're not alcohol themselves, obviously. They are intended to do the opposite, to help you with the alcohol that you consume. So you pick up yourself a pack of one of these, you drink it about you know 30 minutes before you're gonna go out and have your first alcoholic drinks. Keep drinking water and you'll feel better the next day. You can use the QR code on screen, if you scan it, or the link in the description or the link on the screen to get 15% off your first order using that code, Manmade Mead, or again, those links. You should check this out. Thank you to Z-Biotics for sponsoring this video and back to the brewing content. 
So the brew day came around. It was time to start these. We went ahead and gathered all of our equipment, which if you need equipment or anything, there's some links down below to uh, some Amazon store stuff. You can also buy local if you wanna do that, but all of those Amazon links to go to support the channel. So if you do that, feel free to hit those affiliate links. Got our equipment, we sanitized everything, of course, and then we started both brews. The traditional was super simple, honey, water, and yeast to start. We just blended that all together, and our starting gravity for the traditional was, I believe, 1.074. So that wasn't gonna yield a super high ABV brew, about nine point something percent uh, by the end, which the Lalvin 71B will absolutely be able to do. So we knew that was gonna happen. We started that, we blended our uh, stuff up, put our yeast in, we added our Fermate O as our yeast nutrient in the, uh, at the 24 hour mark. You can go through a staggered nutrient schedule, also known as Tosna, and that's a healthier way to ferment your yeast, or help your yeast ferment, excuse me. Um, I just was a little bit lazy, put all my Fermate O in the 24 hour mark, and then it just continued to ferment through that whole process. So once it was done fermenting, we got out of the primary state, it's about two to three weeks to ferment, it started to clear up some, that's how I knew it was done. I also took a gravity reading, which was what I did originally. It started off at 1.074, and it ended at 1.000. At that point, we racked it off of the uh, lees, or the yeast that were there, and we let it set for a while. It just kind of chilled out, had some time to mellow, let things drop down to the bottom that we didn't necessarily want. About a month went by, and then we decided we wanted to go ahead and oak it. So we went ahead and added some oak on top of this. Specifically, I believe I used some French oak chips. I added one half ounce of French oak chips and eight ounces of honey at the same time. Now, some of you are going, wait, shouldn't you have done something before you did that? Of course I did. In order to safely back sweeten this and not allow for re-fermentation, I went ahead and stabilized it with potassium sorbate and metabisulfite. Now that means that I used those two things in conjunction to halt any further fermentation. I waited at least 24 hours after adding those, and then I added my honey. Alternatively, you can pasteurize, which is heating the liquid up. Essentially, you wanna kill off your yeast to where they can't eat more sugar. So stabilized, added eight ounces of radish honey and that half ounce of uh, French oak chips into that brew. We let the oak chips set for roughly, I think it was seven or eight days. They moved pretty quick. And then we went ahead and let it sit for a while longer after racking off of those. And it started to clear. This one, it was cleared with uh, quite a bit of time, I'll say. So it's maybe not the most clear brew in the world, but I would say it's, it's pretty good. You can use things to clear the brew if you want. It's been bottled. This thing is roughly about four months old at this point. So let's switch over to the cherry side. This is a little more complicated. Traditional is done. We started with our maraschino cherries in that primary state. It looked pretty wild, not gonna lie. Mixed up our honey, water, yeast with the maraschino cherries. And the starting gravity for this one was about 1.060. This was a little bit of a bigger batch. And so the honey I used didn't quite get it up to a super high ABV, that's okay. So once we had mixed all that stuff up, I let it just start fermenting. Added my yeast nutrient at 24 hours and I noticed something a little bit interesting and that was, it wasn't fermenting. Now, here's where I went wrong. Maraschino cherries, especially the container I got, that is loaded, not loaded, has some potassium sorbate and some stabilizers that make it shelf stable, make that stuff last for like years. And in my infinite wisdom, I didn't even think about that when I pitched it in there. So. It didn't kick off originally. What I had to do was I had to come back with some more Lalvin 71B, make a yeast starter, so I mixed up some honey and water, threw my yeast into a tiny container. I let that start going for about two or three days to build up a colony. And I was hoping that by adding that and a little bit of water to this brew, I, I basically topped it up with a little bit more water, that I would bring down the amount of uh, stabilizer out of that brew and allow it to start fermenting with my yeast starter. So I pitched that yeast starter, added some more water, which was why this thing is a lower gravity, and that's when it started fermenting. It started kicking up again. 24 hours later, it was going. 
That's the point where we let it start fermenting. It took about three weeks to ferment from 1.060 to 1.000. At that point, it started to clear up. We knew it was done, took a gravity reading. We racked it into a new container off of the cherries, let that set for a little while longer, and it started to uh, just let things settle down to the bottom. We also stabilized this one so we could add our fermentable sugar, which is the honey in this case. And we also wanted to oak it. So we did both things like we did with the traditional. We added some oak, French oak chips specifically for about five to seven days. And we back sweetened with more radish honey. And I noticed that it wasn't quite cherry-y enough. It had a bright cherry note, but I wanted a deeper, richer cherry. So we added cherry juice, specifically black cherry juice. That black cherry juice added some color, first of all, but it also added some uh, more complexity and some sweetness. That all sat in there for probably a good month or two. And not the oak, the oak was only in there for five or seven days. We let it set for a while, it started to clear. This one's also not the most clear brew, that's okay. And then we went ahead and bottled it. Both of these are roughly about three and a half months old, four months old at this point, and we're ready to taste them. So let's go ahead and open them up, take a look. Of course, you can already see the traditional. It's not the most clear brew in the world, but here's our traditional on this side. I think it looks pretty good. Probably could be more clear, but that's fine. And the cherry right here. I love the color on the cherry. Specifically, I think this one is like the most interesting color because it's just so vibrant and red and the black cherry juice really helped with that process. When, my, when I do my tastings, I always like to do the traditional first to get the base value of the honey. We're looking for those vanilla notes. We're looking for some of that soft caramel kind of uh, realm from this. The oak, of course, is there to really help round it out, and it will. Yeah, th this definitely has a, a toffee coffee, not coffee, caramel, excuse me, kind of note. The oak is uh, kind of tame here, to be honest, but it's super interesting. Let's taste it. Yeah, okay, so these, this one specifically is a nine something, nine point something percent. So at three months, there is a small perceived bite from alcohol, which is okay, it happens. But the base value of the honey with that floral side is really interesting. There is a slight, slight subtle spice from this. Kind of like a baking spice realm to me. And I find that to be fun and interesting, especially because this honey is just, it's different. If you're gonna get radish honey, you're gonna expect something different than a clover, a wildflower, orange blossom, something you might normally get. It's very good. It needs a little bit of time to continue to mellow. But I believe that if I were to wait just a few more months, um, that this thing would be at its actual prime and it's like bell curve state, it is pretty close to the top. The top is here. It is pretty dang close. Still drinkable, and again, three and a half, four months old. So this is a good testament that you can drink your meads earlier. Please don't believe that you have to wait nine months to a year to plus to drink your meads. Traditional mead, I love the oak, I love the, the honey character profiles here. It's super fun. Let's go ahead and hop on over to the cherry version. We're still looking for the same notes, but the maraschino cherry side is gonna be interesting. The cherry, it, no, or the maraschino silk, side itself is interesting. It's not necessarily, um, it's a weird kind of cherry, but that's okay. We don't want medicinal cherry. A lot of cherry things taste like that. The, no the nose is super rich and it does have a little bit of bright uh, cherry, but that uh, cherry juice kind of came in clutch, honestly. Inviting and that oak is like a nice little rounding point. This is a lower ABV, which means the body is gonna be a little bit thinner. And there are ways to counteract that with oak, with some wine tannin. You know, I'll be, I would be curious to throw some wine tannin in something like this. It's only like 7%, so that's okay. Complex on the nose, let's try it. Oh yeah, very juicy. Again, not a lot of tannin from this. A decent amount of tannin from the traditional. Light tannin, but the cherry is like complex. It adds a lot of fun note. It is a stone fruit, so I am submitting this to some competitions and I'm curious to see how it does at some comps in the stone fruit category. 
gosh, it's just like complex and the acidity is nice with the sweetness. That oak is just like a little bit of a blanket, like a thin sheet over the top. Just a really, uh, a wrapping paper, so to speak. I love the mix of maraschino black cherry juice combination. I would highly suggest that that's a great thing. Radish honey is not really popping out here, I'll be honest, but it probably does add a little bit of that complexity to this specifically. If you were to take this specific recipe and sub out wildflower or clover honey, you might have a different result and that's okay. Um, I think that there is, there is something to say about adding a complex honey profile underneath. I think it's very good though, low tannin. So I'm, um, you know, if you are somebody who's wants something to chew on, you're probably not gonna love this. I'll be curious again how it does to see how it does at comps. I bet people are gonna comment about the low tannin and that will probably uh, ding some points. So we'll see what happens with that. But radish honey is really fun. You can get this from Flying Bee Ranch, which is an online source. They have great prices. They also have fun kinds of honeys, not just radish, but they also have things that you might know about like meadow foam, like carrot blossom. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones I'm forgetting right now. I've used them a bunch, they're really great. But I've super enjoyed getting to try this honey. If you'd like to see any of the other honeys I've used, I've used literally, nah, I almost said hundreds, tons of honey from uh, various sources. And I always love to do a traditional, you can always depend on that and a recipe of sorts. So you can find those on the channel, but this is a lot of fun. If you want to support the channel, the easiest way to do it is just hit like on this video because that helps it push through the algorithm and hopefully get to the hands of people who are learning mead makers. I'm hoping you've learned something from this. And of course you can subscribe. Subscribing is literally just a way to get my content in your feed easier. And I post a lot of fun and silly content quite a bit. But you can support that way if you want to go above and beyond. I have patrons. I'm going to go and highlight them right here. Patrons uh, for my Patreon and my YouTube members because these people for two bucks a month or more, if you want to support for more, you can support the channel. You get to see all my videos early, which is a great way to just see what's happening. And I super appreciate them and the investment that they put into this channel because they help it run. Believe it or not, uh, getting a thousand views on a video is not quite enough to make a couple gallons of mead. So the Patreon and the YouTube members are what keep this channel running. You too can help keep the channel running with that. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here and hitting like and subscribing. I hope to see you in the future with another video. Feel free to leave a comment below about how you felt about this and I'll see you in the future. Cheers.